Okay, so I want to thank everybody for coming out to sit with us this evening, this fine evening at Monica Art Fair. Um, my name is Gary Green. We have a company that's called Elevation Worldwide, and basically it's a platform to help bridge the gap between these various worlds and art and making it a more unified, single unit that I feel like uh, there's power when we all move together. And in my attempts to bring us all together more, I realized that there was a huge disconnect in a space where it really shouldn't be. And uh, I look at everything that was successful, that I seen work, things that I seen going well, all of the art fairs, the art shows, executive positions from any project that I've done, and I looked and I seen the person that was really, really the backbone of these projects and making these things happen was a strong woman somewhere. Hmm. Anytime you see anything that is, you know, perfected and is running really, really well, just as it should, there's a woman somewhere. I look around this art fair and I see all the amazing exhibitions, all of the uh, installations, everything is set really nice, everything is well organized, everything is laid out, communication, everything is running really, really well. And I look around and I see strong women running, running the show, making it happen. The definition of unsung is the person that is doing the most for others, but not getting the proper recognition. And you look at a hero, that's someone who is coming through, saving the day, keeping things afloat, bringing light where there's darkness. And I consider in this world of art of ours, who is that person? Who are these unsung heroes? Um, I was able to First of all, I want to let y'all know that y'all so awesome. I'm excited and I'm so excited I'm nervous about this. <laughs> y'all so cool, I just wanted to be great, you know? Um, and I felt that there was a problem that the women in this world of art wasn't getting the proper support, not the, the, the celebration, the praise. Basically just your regular just do that you should get anyway. Mm -hmm. And I feel that it's one thing, you hear it enough of women saying, hey, we need y'all help, pay attention. Hey, we need y'all help, pay attention. But I feel that me as a man being part of the problem, why not be part of the solution? And saying, hey, let's stand together, let's work together. Hey guys, y'all tripping, let's do something for the women. Right. Hey guys, get up, let's stand with the women. Right. Let's do something for them, let's be one. Yes. And this is an attempt in that direction. Y'all amazing panelists was all carefully selected. Everyone represents a different position within this world of art. Everyone does something different. But the funny thing is that when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, I noticed that they all had so many similarities. And um, they all came from a position of trying to help others. Even when you get the story on how they started and got into it, the initiative initially that brought them in was to let me try to fix a problem. Let me be the solution. Let me help you out. Let me bring some compassion to this world of art. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the world of art right now, the state of the world, everything needs more compassion. And these women bring compassion to this um, care to this. I mean, it's art. It should have a lot of love and care in it, right? So who else is going to bring that compassion? And I look around, and it is you guys. It's not me. I mean, I'm going to do what I can. But <laughs> it's not like you guys. And, I feel that uh, I spoke enough and I would really like to uh, allow everyone to introduce themselves and just say a couple of things about yourself. Uh, if you want to start here. Okay. So my name is Rachel Clark. I um, recently started the company Queen of Hearts Productions and I curate street art shows and developing an area as well where I curate for charity auctions because I think that that is an opportunity for me to give back to the community. Um, I'm also a Green Gucci girl on Instagram. Cute um, <laughs> Green Gucci suit, thank you. Um, but I always use the hashtag of support living artists and that's my mission um, as a curator is to try and sell art so that um, artists can make a living doing what they love and what they do so well and the joy that they bring to the world with their art. Hi guys, my name is Nicole 
Natasha Roberts, and I'm a New York City-based curator and creative strategist. I work with artists, brands, um, nonprofits as well. My background is actually in public affairs, but my mom was a publicist, so I literally grew up, you know, since 10 years old, working with creatives across the board to help them get attention um, toward their projects. And um, today, my mission is primarily to be a bridge and use art for cross-cultural exchange to, um, you know, just make a difference. Hi everyone, my name is Delilah Martinez. I'm here from Chicago. Um, I'm the owner of VIP Paints, which is a paint and sip I've had about six years. I also own an art gallery called Vault Gallery, and it's about three years old as well. And I also do a little bit of side things. I do artist management. I currently manage an artist named Scent Rock, and I also do um, mural and art broker stuff. I try to curate experiences between um, a collector and an artist. Um, just to kind of make a memorable experience between buying art. Um, and most of the artists that are in my gallery are emerging upcoming artists uh, from all around. Okay, here we go. Hi, <laughs> my name is Sophia Dawson. I am a believer, I'm a mother, I'm an artist, an activist, also an educator. I, my work is about exposing stories from folks who've been incarcerated for political beliefs for 40, 50 years. Um, I advocate for my students. I teach art at Rikers Island in Queens. Um, mothers who've lost their kids to police brutality. It was at Central Park Five before they won their suit against New York City. Um, and yeah, basically whatever God puts on my heart to do, I take it as an assignment. My, my practice is more like a ministry and I'm really happy to be here. Hi, um, my name is Libby Shuttle, and I'm an artist and a writer. Um, I'm also a street artist, and I go under the name Phoebe New York. Um, my art is, my street art is mostly all over downtown, and I make art, I think, about being human, and putting messages in my art about what it is to be human, and the girl that I make is, she's my alter ego, so everything that I put into her is coming from me and she's helping me to do all the things that I'm saying and my messages are, they're very strong things like be confident and risk it and don't be afraid and she's really the thing that pushes me to not be afraid and to do all those things and I, when people come across her, I think that's what is kind of it's showing me that the art is valuable in that way. I think that's pretty awesome. I want to get y'all there. You know, those are some amazing, uh, <laughs> amazing introductions, amazing things you guys are doing and have been doing. For me, what I would kind of like to share with everyone else is the thing that got the fire started and you to even want to say, hey, I want to do that. Hey, I want to be a part of this. Or hey, I want to create some change. And off the top, because I'm not going to go in the road, we're going to bounce around a little bit. Delilah had a really interesting story to me. <laughs> I felt that um, because she's so compassionate, there was a, someone that was very close to her where there was a a problem and she sought out to be the solution for it. Mm. And uh, Delilah, please share that with you. Thank you, Gary. Um, so how I started the art gallery, so I'll just do a little before. I did have this campaign for about six years and I was dating an artist um, that was supposed to have a solo show and it got canceled last minute. At the time, I just opened up my second store for her sip and paint and I just decided, I told him, you know, don't worry about it. Let's just have your show in my gallery, and not my gallery yet, in my other store, The Sip and Paint. And he was like, you don't know nothing about selling art. Um, you don't know nothing about curating shows or, you know, just putting art shows together. And I was like, no, I got that this. That sounds crazy. Right. <laughs> it, is, it is really crazy. Um, so I'm like, no, I got this. Just let me handle it. Show's not canceled. Show must go on, and we can put it in. 
the second store, and that's how the vault gallery actually began. Um, we had the show, we had 17 pieces, I sold 13 of them, and I noticed that I was really good at it because I knew the story behind it. I was with him while he created the work, I knew what it meant to him, and um, right off the bat, I knew that um, I was really good at selling artwork because I knew the story and I also believed in the story behind it. Um, so that's kind of how I model my gallery and how I sell for artists. I need to like the artwork, I need to know the story behind it, I need to also feel the depth in it, and that's how I became really good at selling a lot of the stuff that comes through my gallery. Can I rewind for one second? Sure. So you sped over this part really fast? Yeah. Many people understand, you had a business, and this guy was like, hey, uh, my show got canceled, and he's like, you know what, let me build a whole new business. <laughs> But you open up a whole new gallery, so we'll just do this now, and this is what we'll do, and it worked out. Mm -hmm. How did you do that over, like, just like that? So it really was like maybe a week's time I had to um, produce and curate this whole stuff, and I just right away started marketing, and we had about 100 people come, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it was really difficult, but I'm really good at displaying stuff. I've always had an appreciation appreciation for art and I always went to art shows um, I really just did it because I felt kind of bad that he felt bad about his show being canceled not really knowing that I was going to be good at selling the artwork um, but I became really good at it and from that point on um, since I do have a sip and paint I do work with a lot of Chicago artists they started to then ask me to throw them art shows from that point um, and that's how it kind of really began um, I kind of just seen the passion with me selling the work, um, and yeah. Cool. There's that compassion again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sophia, yes. you had a very, very compassionate story. I was moved. I know there's a lot of them, <laughs> but the one you told me about keeping that legacy alive and how you kind of got into creating more, and that got you into your purpose. Okay. Yes, please. So um, when I was about 17, 31 now, um, I had a family member, my godmother, so she's basically like a second mother to me. Um, we lived together in a two-family house, and um, my family was upstairs and she was downstairs. And uh, one day, during like my high school years, she just like disappeared. And nobody would tell any of the kids in the family that she had gotten locked up or that there was all this stuff going on, the reasons behind it, they kept it from us. And it took some time to even figure out where she was, but um, we learned that she was at Rikers, and um, so I went from like, mind you, this is like high school years, first boyfriend, that whole situation was going on in my personal life. Um, being able to go downstairs and knock on the door and like cry or whatever, tell her all the juice, to like having to take a train, take a dollar van to Rikers Island, having to write her letters. And um, in the beginning, you know, the family was very supportive. Her husband um, lived with her. Um, my family, we used to write her, we used to go see her. But, you know, she was hit with a 10-year sentence. And she was moved from Rikers to Albion Correctional Facility, which is about 10 hours in a bus upstate. And people, I just saw a shift, like, over the course of maybe five years, I realized that nobody was talking about her, nobody was writing her, nobody was gonna see her. And um, it frustrated me. There was like another woman around, and I was like, oh, hell no. Like, I, was, I couldn't pretend that I wasn't upset about what was going on. And so um, I was living in Harlem at the time, and I turned my living room into a studio. And I basically pulled, she used to model back in the 80s, so I started pulling from all of her old photographs and combining it with different aspects of serving time and her current situation and um, making these paintings. And nobody knew that I was making them. I didn't realize when I made those, there was no like social media to be like, this is what I'm working on. I was like in the hole, like at night, making these paintings. And I had a show, um, a friend of mine helped me put together my first solo show when I was 21. And um, we hung the paintings, invited the family out. Mind you, the family don't know what I've been working on. They, they are just living their best life, right, with this new lady around. And um, yeah, when they came in and saw the work, it was the first time, like I was given a talk just like this, and when I looked up, my whole family, her husband, everybody was in tears. And I had never seen that 
happened before. And I was like, oh, so this is what art can do. Because I couldn't, nobody would listen before that. And um, on a spiritual note, you know, like I said, she had a 10 year sentence, but after that show, she came home maybe like eight, nine months after that. She only spent five years away. And so that was also the beginning of me realizing like, okay, you know, that's why I call it a ministry because like there's something about folks who are in bondage who God wants me to help through my work. And that was the first time that I saw someone come home early. And that's been happening a lot since then. That's amazing. Thank you. Rachel, I know me and you have a similar affinity for street art, as I think we all do. And I also want y'all to know, like, we all talked about a lot of this before we came up here because we take y'all time serious. We want to get to the point and we want to make sure that we talking about the, the quality things, get to the meat and potatoes of it. You know what I mean? Just up here blowing hot air. But um, you told me about street art and how it was a bittersweet thing. You love to see it go up. You hate to see it come down and it's covered up. It's like this person actually took a chance and risked, you know, whatever freedom or whatever it is to get their message across and how they needed proper representation. Could you speak to that? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot in to unpack in the word of bittersweet. Um, uh, I kind of Street art was there for me when I was like a shell of a person. And so I think that's probably why it's so important to me. Um, and because what I found is once it could identify artists and then see the relationship and how the artists interact with each other, and then it became like a treasure hunt and, and started to follow them. And then the more I understood it, and if I was walking lower Manhattan, I got to a point where I would know okay, Bowery and Kenmar, here's a throw up um, by this person. And then a week later, somebody, it had either been whitewashed or somebody else put um, a different tag or, or something on it. And so the ephemeral nature of street art is really um, kind of intoxicating um, in terms of there's always something new. And it really is, you're able to, um, it's, at, it's accessible for everyone, right? You don't have to go uptown to Fifth Avenue or even over to the west side to the Whitney to see art. There is art happening every day. Um, and I think part of what I want to do is I want people mainstream who still make that connotation between vandalism and graffiti and street art and they just mm -hmm. throw it all in the same bucket and I understand that it's because they haven't been able to have a conversation about it. They haven't had somebody sit down and say, okay, well, these are all of the steps it takes to actually put up that wheat case. And this is all of the time that people think about um, creating that sticker and, and the money that people spend to create these stickers to put them on the street. It's an investment and the artists are investing in themselves. And so I really want, um, a broader audience to understand how valuable and talented the street artists are. Um, but going back to part of your question about what they risk, um, there is of course a risk in terms of um, street art addiction. There, there's a hotline and there was recently a documentary and you talk about there's, I think it's just detectives that sit and unmark fans and look for people doing street art. And um, so you take a chance to put your art out there partially because whole other subject but like the galleries are so close and the bullshit gallery scene and where else are you going to be able to put your art out um, and so I think that there are a lot of reasons that people do it and I just have the utmost respect for the creativity as well as this think outside the box entrepreneurial nature that um, is necessarily found in people who are working on the street and being willing to put something up that can easily be taken away, um, t torn down in Freeman Valley. If you guys haven't been Freeman Valley, I definitely need to check it out, especially in like a month when all of it gets put back up because it was recently like painted this disgusting taupe beige color. Yeah. That was like a way, it like broke my heart when I go in there. But um, so yeah, if anybody here hasn't been to Freeman Valley, you have to go um, because that's, anybody who's everybody wants to be there and then that's where you can learn. Um, so I think, 
once you can kind of identify, like um, Libby's talked about her Phoebe character, and you will see her everywhere, and then you can kind of start to connect with the artist, and then you can identify when the artist has a new piece, or a new sticker, or a new mm -hmm. something, and then it's exciting, and then you're able to engage. Um, so. Oh. Well, since you're wrong. <laughs> Come on, Libby, we want to know about, because, side note, yeah. we was in the hotel earlier today and just randomly walked past one of the pieces in the hallway. I'm like, this, she's everywhere, she's killing me. I was really shocked to see it was in the hotel. That was amazing. <laughs> that was nice. Um, but, yeah, I think going back with what Rachel was saying about the street, and um, before I went onto the street, I... It's hard for me to even think back to when I was trying to get seen by people and I wasn't able to get seen by people and going up to gallery doors or asking people to look at my work and just doors really being shut. And I try not to remember that because it feels like a long time ago, but it was only about maybe five or six years ago before that was happening. And I think people discouraging me that this, they just couldn't understand the art. They couldn't understand what it was I was giving them or you know, maybe they related, but I couldn't even get into a pharmacy window. I tried to get into a pharmacy window, and it was like, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I'm like, really? I can't get in here. So when I found the street, it was, as I've always felt, and I think this is very important about my work and me, is that I've always felt like someone who was never seen. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be seen so badly my whole life. Um, and especially when I started doing art, I've been doing this for 15 years and making my work. But until I got on the street, oh, actually I should say when I had a first show in 2007, it was a great show, but the only people who came were friends and family. And I thought that was wonderful. I said this thank you, but at the end of the show I asked, the, I, was, I was almost embarrassed to ask the gallery owner, I said, did any strangers come? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, we had one, one guy came in. And it was so upsetting to me because I thought, the real test is strangers. It's really, it's the people out there who are looking at the work. And until I got on the street, I, I was scared. I thought, what if nobody sees it? What if nobody notices it? Because I believed in it so much. And I'll never forget the first time I, someone tagged it on Instagram and I was shocked. I said, oh my God, someone saw this. Hmm. And then it got tagged again and I kept going out. And it was, it was working. I'm like, this, people understand me. And they're seeing it. And they're relating. And it's changing people's lives. And it's changing my life when people come to me and they say, this helped them, or this made them quit their job, or this made them do this. And I'm like, oh my god, I, these people feel like me. And when I, I was arrested for this a couple of years ago also, and it was a very traumatic experience, and I thought, I, I, I can't do this again. I can't. It was so devastating, obviously, and yet it only took me a week before I decided, no, I can do this again. I actually will do this again, and I will continue to do this because this is making me, you know, and I will say it is hard to keep up because you have to keep up, and mm -hmm. I think one of the questions asked to me as how would, a, a while ago in an interview was what advice would you give a female street artist, and I think it really comes down to really what advice would you give any street artist is that you have to stay up there. You have to stay up because if you, if you come down, it's like the work, you can't find it. And so I spend a lot of time, she's like my child, walking around, redoing, re keeping her up there, fixing her arm, fixing her head, repasting it back down. I take it very seriously. There she is. I think the time we talked on the phone, it was probably like 12 at night. She was like, yeah, getting ready to go back oh, out. I wow. was. Got some work to do. I, got to go I feel like up. I can't tell everyone that. <laughs> wow. We'll get into it, you know. This happened 10 years ago to talk. We just remembered it. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Um, switching paces a little bit, you had a really, really great story. Like, the things that you said about your mom and how you were brought up, I was like, I really wish I met that lady. Like, she sounds super amazing. Mm -hmm. And uh, go ahead. Well, originally, I'm from the Philadelphia area. and. Um, very happy to say that my family is very involved in community organizing there. Um, I come from a really culturally, religiously diverse um, family in general, so um, that was a, a lot of the influence that my aunts had on me when I was young. Um, 
one of my great aunts was one of the organizers of the first Million Woman March. Another one of my aunts taught urban studies and cross-cultural communications at UPenn. And my mother worked um, as a press secretary in the mayor's office. And I got to be in that environment as a very young child. And one day I was actually sitting in the mayor's chair. Um, my mom and I were like just in there and he walked in. And we both kind of like jumped and were feeling awkward about being caught in that situation. And he was like, sit down, you could be the mayor one day, you might even be the president. And I was like, wow, you know, for someone important to tell me that felt so good. And I started to think about what I did want to do and what I could do to help other people because a person in that position has to take care of a city and take care of the people that are there and listen to all of the things that they care about and help push forth those important causes. Um, my mom also worked for one of the most popular radio stations in Philadelphia, so I just had a culmination of these experiences and exposure at a really young age to where I thought that it was kind of normal to you know, publicize things and go out and do community organizing and just start speaking to strangers on the street about what they care about and help them register to vote and things like that. Um, it was really important to me, so I ended up studying in Washington thinking that I would get into politics, but ultimately my goal is still to become an ambassador and I feel that I do that through art because I curate immersive experiences, I work with emerging artists because it is important to support living artists. Um, a lot of us you know, recognize that now, which is great. Um, <laughs> I studied perfumery at Pratt out of passion and I took some classes at Sotheby's and continuing education at NYU because I don't have an MFA and it can be really intimidating to enter the fine art world being an outsider in that way. It is very exclusive. Um, so for me, being a Taurus, I'm a very willful person. I think I'm pretty resourceful and when there is a, where there is a will, there really is a way and it's about kind of figuring out what your goal is, reverse engineering and maybe looking at some of your peers and kind of studying how they got to where they are and definitely taking the opportunity just if you love art, go to art galleries, start reading the artist statements, the exhibition summaries, the press releases that press releases that galleries provide to media so that you can educate yourself on what you're supposed to recognize, what the artist intended to share and you know, that'll even help you personally in your analysis of art and, you know, to become more comfortable with um, participation. And I think it's even more important to find your allies and definitely look for the community that you can be a part of um, from a place of passion. One thing I've definitely learned is that you shouldn't go into selling art if you're in it for the money. It's really got to be about the love um, and appreciation for what these people are giving to, uh, to us and, you know, touching each other through this experience and sharing that together. I like when y'all do that, by the way. I feel encouraged. <laughs> I want to shift gears a little bit. Like, I feel like it's been nice, we've been friendly. Uh, it's cute, but we ain't really come to play today. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I want to get to, like, because there's a problem, and we need to address the problem, and then once we address the problem, we need to find a solution for the problem. Um, so if we could take the gloves off a little bit. <laughs> you told me something that broke my heart the other day. I just want you to know that. Okay. <laughs> you tell me, you going out every night, every day, putting in work, grinding harder than most humans. Killing myself, yes. Literally. <laughs> Literally. And we just found out you went to jail, you got street yes. cred now. Yeah. <laughs> in the streets. You going through all of this day in, day out, coming from working now. And when it came to somebody asking if you was a street artist, you didn't feel that you could, you know, claim that you put either. in like <laughs> twice the amount of work. Yeah. What is going on to make you feel that way? I, I want us to understand from you guys, because it's definitely not about me. I'm just some guy that showed up today. <laughs> it's really about understanding your perspective and the current disposition of women in the world of art. So could you speak? Yeah, I, I, it's, it is, and it, it's such an interesting, question and subject when I actually had two separate accounts um, on Instagram because I didn't quite know if I was a street artist. I thought, maybe I'm not, and I don't want to own this term if, if I'm not. And yet I was out, you know, the, 
when we're doing this docu series and we're talking about it, and the director, she's constantly telling me, she's like, Libby, but you're out there, like you're everywhere, you're you're constantly doing it. And I'm like, I know, but I don't know if I'm if I'm if I am, and I, I don't know why I couldn't actually officially own that for so long until I did, until I made the commitment to actually say, okay, I am cool enough, I am actually a woman who's out there doing it, and I shouldn't be afraid to admit that and to stand up for myself about it. Um, because it really it was a troubling thing. It went on in my mind for months and almost maybe two years before I switched over, got rid of that separate account, combined everything, my collage work, and the street, and I actually I'm owning this, and I, I want to be proud of this, and say this is this is who I am, this is this is what I'm doing. But you're you're right. Like getting back to why why is that? Why couldn't I say who I was or wh what I was doing? I mean, I had a, an event a couple of weeks ago, and it felt very similar in the fact that they were they were recognizing me. It was a, an event for 200 women, and I did the artwork for the event. Um, and I think I told you this, when they said my name to introduce me, I started crying because I couldn't quite, I, I couldn't quite understand that they were saying my name mm -hmm. and that I was actually, I had come this far and I actually had earned them to say my name and, and to come to be, to be there. Um, and when Gary asked me today, it was like, oh my God, he's, he, he wants me to talk. And, and, and again. Um, um, uh, you talk. <laughs> Thank you. But it, it's an important thing for a woman, I think, to start owning her name, to start owning who she is. And the more you do that, the easier it becomes. And even as an actor, I was acting maybe 15 years ago, and the hardest thing for me to do was to slate, was to say my name. And she said, Libby, you can't say your name. Like, you've got to figure out, own it when you slate. And I, it, it has taken me this long to actually say it, state it, believe it, and believe in myself, and that's all my work, the alter ego is the thing that gets me there. Um, so, yeah, I feel great today that I can do that. That's beautiful. That's Thank beautiful. you. Still working on it, but, you know, you it's yeah, Just own it. It is it's own, yours. Yeah, just, keep, get, just keep going. <laughs> that's all. Yeah. Please. You told me uh, something else that broke my heart as well. It's oh, like, God. I was breaking my heart. I was okay. Know, Say it. Like, I don't know what it was. Going. I want to hear it. Me here what broke your heart. Let's go. But it's like you're putting in the same work that the guys are, mm -hmm. discussing the same subject matter, mm -hmm. um, standing up for the same social injustices, having the same amount of courage, but yet you're treated like a little sister. Right. Yes, the little sister. What is that? Baby sis. Um, I don't know what causes that, um, but I can say that I've definitely, you know, run into my male counterparts in the art world and been in the same room on panels like this even and just the way that they are acknowledged and respected the folks who will reach out to them after uh, something like this and want to continue to work with them i don't know what i can't see the difference between myself and them but i know that i'm definitely treated differently um i don't think about this very much that's someone else when you ask me i was like why are you asking me this but um, that's because I try not to, it will discourage you. It, can, it could discourage you if you allow it to. But the way my God life is set up, I do have, I do carry a lot of confidence and boldness and it's not to boast, but it's like boasting that I know who created me. I know that I have a purpose and I know that I'm obedient in the work. So I ha it has to pay off some way, somehow. You know, like there are scriptures that talk about, you know, children of the promises being the head and not the tail. And I have to, even if I'm not, even if physically it doesn't show up like that, even if my Instagram numbers don't say that, I have to still walk and carry that because that's earnestly what I believe. Um, and then, yeah, I just think that sometimes people can underestimate me and my abilities. Um, like, but that's why, like you said, you have to continue to do the work so that people can see what you're capable of. It's very easy to share what you do online. It's very easy to do things and show it in real time. And so I don't really have time to entertain, like, you know, the way that part of the art world is set up because I'm on a mission. And like I said, everything that I do is just because it gets dropped on my heart anyway by the spirit. So, um, yeah, it doesn't frustrate me, but I think that there are things that can be done, and maybe that's the question after that, so that things don't be this way. And I think that um, the folks who have the authority to change things, even 
even if it's something as, as simple as someone who is my counterpart, my peer in the arts as a man, you know, when you're looking for people, when people are being, when people are looking for people to do things and you know that this sister does this and she's really good at it, give her the opportunity, especially if you yourself can't take it. If there's room for two or three, include a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, I have to get better at doing that. Um, I was talking to you about that, like, I get approached with mural opportunities. I have a nine-year-old son. I can't work for free. And it's been like that since I've been pregnant, like, no. Um, but I won't shut down the opportunity. I'll put one of my students on, one of the young girls who are on the come up, one of the young men that are on the come up. So like, getting better at, you know, networking and like being a resource and realizing that you also came from, maybe you came from the same place that this woman is in right now. So who are you to like turn a shoulder? Um, yeah. So what I hear from both of you, right, is yes. like you're being mistreated and you find a really cool way to deal with it. Yes. And, and life goes on. And keep pushing. That's terrible. That's not okay. That's not the, that's not how it should be. That's, there's guys out here, right? Mm -hmm. And I like, I've never been in your shoes. I don't know how you feel. If I say something stupid on accident, I don't know how that make you feel. But if I did, then maybe I would be able to correct that and make sure if I hear somebody else saying that, I tap them, hey, hey man, don't say that no more. Like, watch, you know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. for either of you, Libby, I wanna know how it make you feel. And we ain't gotta sit on this in a long time, but I just, I need to know, like, how does that make you feel? Mm -hmm. Makes me feel like y'all ain't got no respect. Um, <laughs> It makes me feel like you do not respect my work or who I am or what I carry. And um, I'm not gonna put you down for that. I'm not gonna mistreat you for that, but I'm just gonna side at you next time I see you. Cause I know that I can't, I can't bang with this one. Um, I feel like, I don't know. I mean, it's crazy cause like, as a woman, yes, I do feel things I'm very deeply. Do I share that often? No, because you know, that's expected, that's a stereotype. That's why sometimes people will rather work with a man than a woman, because apparently we can't get our emotions together. Apparently we can't not flirt with the person that we're working with, like all this other stuff. So I hold it together very well. I don't feel comfortable sharing how I deeply feel, but um, I would say respect. I would say give respect where it's due. I would say give honor where it's due. I would say if you love the work, look at the work, stop looking at me. And, and give the work another platform. Look at the work, stop, stop looking, stop at, looking me. at me. Yes, that's our thing. You wanna add? Should I add? If you got some. <laughs> uh, got so, I know, I want it. You know, I think it's another, it's another interesting thing. It's how does it make me feel? And I think it goes back so far. And I think it's, it's one of these things where it's like apologizing, you know, hmm. especially to a man. I'm always sorry. Hmm. I'm always saying thank you repeatedly when I'm not sorry. It's like I apologize all the time when I'm not sorry, and I don't know why. I'm just like, I'm sorry, I'm Me so too. sorry. Right? And, and, it's a problem. And I need to cut that. And I, I'm trying to teach myself to stand up and just, you know, when, like, you know so even a printer, it's like something's late three weeks late and I'm like okay I'm so sorry but it's like can I can I get my print and I'm yelled at because it's like suddenly it's my fault that I need the thing that I wanted you know right away that I paid for and it happens all the time when I pay for things mm -hmm. and I pay a lot for a lot of the things that I'm, I'm doing and I'm treated in this way that's like I'm suddenly apologizing in your opinions is there something that is uh, consciously done by men that you work with or do you think that it's something that has just been ingrained in them and how they've been brought up to work and that they don't even really realize that they're treating you like a little sister or they're treating you like this? You read on that or something? <laughs> yeah. I think that is, that is part of it. Um, and I think it really comes down to being very tough and just saying, you know what, I'm not apologizing. I have to get into this and I have to find a very smart very professional way to approach it, and if I can't, then I kind of have to walk away from it and find a good relationship. Because I think not only romantically, you know, when you're involved with a man, and I've been in a lot of bad relationships that have taught me when how not to get involved in a bad relationship. So I'm very aware of the signs. So when I walk into a gallery, I walk into a store, I walk into, 
I'm aware of that dynamic almost immediately now. And I think, how do I, how do I approach this now? How do I deal with this? And I find myself doing the sorry, and then I'm like, you know what? Let's try to change it. Try to switch your, your, you know, your response. Because I think it's all about the response, is how can you change that? Because it becomes a pattern, and then the pattern gets out of control. Delilah and Rachel, I know you guys had a lot to say about women being apologetic and how they need to stop doing that. Hmm. I'm like chomping at the bit. <laughs> so if you don't want to go, I'm going to go. Like, I have been, uh, yeah, so I'm so glad you mentioned the apologizing thing. Um, and so to the men in the room, if a woman apologizes to you, take a step back and say, was that a valid reason to apologize? Wait, we're talking about solutions here. The solution is to change the dynamic between the genders. And if a woman apologizes because it's bred into us from it's partially innate because we are these compassionate, empathetic people, sorry for putting you out, but also because society tells us to. If a woman apologizes to you and it's because you were late, have the cojones to stand up and say, actually, it's my fault. I'm sorry that I did that I made this leap. And have the self-awareness of how you've contributed to that situation. So free tip, that's something a man can do, is if a woman's apologizing to you, take a step back and wonder why. And yes, every time, actually, Gary and I were exchanging texts, and I made a request to him, and the story I told him is, I actually consciously did not apologize for just asking that I wanted my name branded properly. And then he said, of course, no problem. And then a little bit later I was like, but I really hope it's not a problem. And then I, because he and I have this good relationship, I, I mean, but it, I mean, but that was the step. So mm -hmm. understanding, so stop apologizing mm -hmm. because we will never under apologize. It's just not in our DNA, so stop and, and you want to be nice. It's like it's like you want you don't want anyone to look, get mad at you. And it's like, well, you know what? If I'm the other problem with that though is that society says that if you're an assertive woman, you're a bitch, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes. Facts. Yes. If anybody hasn't heard that before, I'm here to tell you it's absolutely yeah. fucking true. <laughs> so that's the other thing that needs to happen is if you're in a room where there's a bunch of men and they're having a conversation about a woman saying, she's too straightforward, she's too direct, she's, she's too anything, then as a man, if you're gonna be an ally to other women, then you should stand up and say, actually, there's nothing wrong with her speaking her voice because she is smart, she deserves to be here, and we pay her only 70% of what we pay you, but we pay her to be here. Yes. We love a strong woman. There you go. Yes. So, I'm gonna try and calm down now, but. <laughs> you don't even have to. It's okay, you don't have to. You don't have to. It's all family down here. Yes. It's all family down here. Yeah, actually, I do want to touch up on what she just said about. Um, yeah, so we just have to own it more. And then also, I find that sometimes when I'm working with men, or sometimes they do always say that women are a little bit more emotional or a little bit more passionate. And I'm emotional. We all are emotional, and um, I always say that, yeah, I am emotional. I am passionate about my business. I am emotional and passionate, and I do have a lot of drive when it comes to me selling artwork or working with customers or collectors, and why would you want to work with anybody that doesn't have that in them, that doesn't have that drive or passion for you as well as they do for themselves? I have been called emotional at times, and I apologize for it. Um, but that's how my business works. That's how I become successful because I am emotional about everything that I do. And I do have passion and drive. And I do want to touch um, on what you just said and how men, I feel that sometimes men listen to other men. So the way we also could correct it is just like what you, you were saying about if Gary or somebody was to say, you know what, you know, don't apologize. Um, she is right or she isn't emotional. Um, she is strong. Men listen to men mostly, what is what I noticed. They don't always listen to women. Um, so I would like to see more of that also in men. Sticking up for women um, a little bit more louder, and then I feel that other men will follow the lead on that as well. Mm -hmm. For the people that just walked in, some of the men in the back, we sit here discussing more ways that we could be supporting women and what not to do, and some things that we can be doing to support them more. 
I just wanted to fill y'all in. I also wanted to say what that. What else can we be doing? A lot of men, they say they support women. They're all about women empowerment. But really be about that. So sometimes when I'm working with men, um, they'll have me do all the work and they'll take the recognition. Mm -hmm. um, they don't really tell me, they won't really shout me out on the work that I have done. Um, so that to me is, is not really supporting women. And also understanding sometimes that we do have depth and story and understanding why we're speaking that way. Um, I think that men don't always really take the time to do that. They say they support women, they say they're about women empowerment, but they don't really also put us in that leadership roles. For example, I um, was talking to an artist yesterday and she was telling me about a project she's working on to have to do with women lingerie. And they ask men to do the photography, they ask men to do certain things. And, and I think when it comes to women products or women things, they should have women doing that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Or if it's certain um, nationalities, they should have people doing it for that. If it's people of color, they should have people of color working on the projects. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see more of that as well. I'm, I'm yes. starting to get a little pumped up. That's true. Like, you know. no, so. Look at I'm saying sorry. You gotta stop doing that. <laughs> sorry. Let me sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Is there anything? Um, I mean, me as a guy, and I feel like the other guys in here, even these guys over in the corner, I feel like they appreciate the points that y'all made. Mm -hmm. I feel like they appreciate um, the tips that y'all giving us. Is there? Clearly, you guys have a lot of experience and expertise in the fields that you've been. You know, performing in, is there any other tips that you may be able to offer any women uh, that we haven't covered already? I definitely feel strongly about remembering that we can say no. You don't have to just go along with the plan. You don't have to just do something to make other people happy. Um, especially for those of us who are startups, you know, working for ourselves, just starting, you know, a lot of people expect women to barter or to just help you know and to provide services for free to just be in this supporting role that is expected of us but it's important for us to remember that we have to do what's best for us as long as the intent you know i had to ask myself what is the intent here you know i'm not trying to hurt anyone else by saying no i'm trying to move forward my goals and do the right thing for myself and i think it's really important for women to just not be afraid to say no. There will be other opportunities. It doesn't have to be now. I love women empowerment and just empowering others. And what I learned when you support others, we get things done really quickly. Yes. No leader does anything alone. It has to do with, it's, it's like what you were saying earlier. Um, it takes a community. I really feel my success is based on everybody else around me supporting me. It's not just me alone. And everybody is born with a gift. Yeah. I know something you don't know, she knows something you don't know, and vice versa. But when we all work together to give each other that information, we all empower each other. We could all be lifted together. It takes more energy to push people down and be a hater yeah. than to actually uplift somebody, and then every, all of us could win together. So that competitiveness, mm, I never really do good with that. Mm -hmm. I do better when I empower other people, and I just always try to encourage people. And just being on the panel with these women and them welcoming me before I even got here, she met up with us earlier for brunch. That's how people become successful, become leaders, by helping each other out and empowering each other. Yeah. And I just want to always um, tell people that, act of kindness, asking how people are doing, we're all going through things. It's really important, even if you're at a cash register and the person at behind the register, everybody's going through something. Mm -hmm. Just taking a second to asking somebody, how is your day going? Nice. What time are you getting off? Just it. When you look at somebody's eyes, you can kind of see that they're going through something right away, just like I am. We all are. And I just want to walk in kindness and just kind of tell everybody a little bit about that, too. Yeah. Awesome. Real quick, the last thing you tell everybody where to find you and what you Um, My businesses are also go by VIP Paints, Vault Gallery. I just opened up a whole new space in Chicago. I'll be combining the two and I will be opening um, a grand opening show called The Slap Show. It has about 105 artists from all around, curated by Kauai, so that's my grand opening show, June 1st. 
check me out on Vault Gallery. I also have an Instagram called Boss Women Chronicles that kind of just talks about all yes. the hardships of owning a business. You might catch me crying on there, pulling my hair out, looking a hot mess. Basically keeping it from real, keeping it real when it yes. comes to being an entrepreneur because it's not fun and games, it's not peaches and cream. So you can follow me on Boss Women Chronicles where I kind of keep it real about all that stuff. Nice. I love that. Um, what was the question again? Where can we find you? Where can, I find Where can we find you? Well, you something to look out for. Um, so on Instagram, it's Phoebe New York. The girl's name Phoebe, and then New York, uh, all spelled out. And you can also find me on the street as well. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, I'm trying to keep it up there. Street. And also a docu series that should be coming out 2020. Um, I've been working on that the last five years, and that actually started before I was a street artist. It was, it, it just happened that I went out there. So it kind of is, you know, we're trying to figure out how to kind of not show my face in the beginning because she wants to keep it more discreet. But yeah, that's exciting. Okay, hi. So you can find Sophia Dawson on Instagram. Everything I am wet paint, just like how you say I am wet paint. Um, I have, uh, I'm a part of a residency right now through the Bronx Museum. So towards the end of June, we're gonna have some type of exhibition. I've been working on a performance piece on taps and roller skates, pray for me. Um, I'm not gonna say anything else about that until it's time. Um, and then yeah, so tomorrow I'll be, it'll be the pre-order launch of my book called So You Wanna Paint a Mural and um, I think that's it. Uh, I have a show, I have an opening to go to right now at the Nathaniel Cummings Foundation. There's a Young Lords exhibition. Um, it's a group show. So there's a lot of stuff going on. You can find everything on my Instagram. I am Blood Paint. Okay. Uh, so you can find me on Instagram at Natasha CR. That's N A T A S H A C R. And um, some of the things I have upcoming are, of course, I'll continue consulting with artists, helping everyone work toward their goals, curating exhibitions around social justice issues, social causes. Rachel and I might have something for women coming up this fall. Um, I'm also on the founding team of a new social media platform that's going to be launching soon. It's called Wave. And our mission is to empower creators by allowing them to monetize their content. It's social media, not social advertising. And we believe that uh, the creation of content and the ability to use these platforms to share your work, your art, um, your gift with the world, it should be a sustainable um, a sustainable thing. Um, so looking forward to sharing more about that soon. And I am also on the team at Art Muse. It's a 20-year-old art advisory firm based here in New York, um, primarily started through essentially selling old masters um, artworks and has now developed into art tours and galleries, museums around the world. Um, we're in Berlin, Paris, uh, New York, London, LA, etc. This summer I'm going to be leading the tour at the Met um, around their the Costume Institute's exhibition on camp, that's fashion specifically. And you can look for uh, some upcoming corporate partnerships and public um, arts projects from us at Art Muse as well that I will be spearheading later this year. Okay. Uh, so thank you everybody for coming. My name is Rachel Clark. Uh, green Gucci girl, even though I'm also known as Red. Um, so that part doesn't make sense. Uh, so my website that has a little bit of information uh, is called WeHeartStreetArt.com. My company is Queen of Heart Productions. This summer I'm working on something fun with an artist from Brazil. Uh, my Valentine's show because I basically love everything about hearts. Um, next year, 2020, the plan is three different countries um, featuring a bunch of South American artists. We've got a call on that tomorrow. So uh, stay tuned. Thanks so much. Perfect. Any questions? Woo! Thank you all. Thank you guys for listening. Thanks for having us. My name is Gary Green. Uh, follow us on Instagram at ElevationWW. Also log on to www.elevationworldwide.com. And subscribe to our YouTube channel.